Hello everyone, and welcome to the podcast of English composer Andrew Downs. My name is Paula Downs, I'm Andrew's younger daughter, and on today's show I'm delighted to be reading chapter 16 from my granddad's book, Around the Horn, by Frank Downs. Chapter 16 includes Life in a BBC Orchestra, 1953, Leo Wurmser. Vienna, Nazi occupation and escape from Austria. Richard Strauss, Fritz Busch, Sir Herbert Beerbohm Tree. Hamlet, Southerminster, Philharmonia Orchestra, Toscanini. Leo Wurmser, the associate conductor, was an incredibly gifted musician. Born in Vienna to a Scottish mother and Jewish father, he was a child prodigy on the piano and cello, later studying those instruments and composition at the Vienna State Academy. Such was his brilliance that in his early teens he was made repetiteur and assistant conductor at the Dresden Opera House under Fritz Busch and Richard Strauss and worked in the first performance of that composer's Arabella. Subsequently, he worked with Clemens Krauss and Bruno Walter. I had first heard of Leo Wormser at the Edinburgh Festival in 1947, where, as I have already related, I met the principal horn player of the Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra, Gottfried Freiburg. Freiburg had spoken at length in the Artists' Club in Edinburgh about a fellow student at the Vienna State Academy named Leo Wormser, with whom he shared student accommodation. He was, he said, quite outstanding, and they performed together in many horn and piano recitals in their teens. The last time he had seen Leo, apparently, was in 1938 in Vienna, shortly after the Nazis had annexed Austria. This conversation with Freiburg in 1947 came back to me like a recorded playback one lunchtime in the BBC canteen in Birmingham when Leo, sitting opposite at the table, began to talk about his friend of student days in Vienna, Gottfried Freiburg. I cannot recall how the conversation started, but I do remember we were discussing the Beethoven sonata for horn and piano. Freiburg had not elaborated about 1938 and the Hitler takeover of Austria other than to say how terrible things were at that time. However, shortly after my conversation in the BBC canteen, Leo fell ill with a duodenal ulcer and was for some weeks a patient in an Edgebaston nursing home. On one of my visits, he unfolded a remarkably sad story of the days in 1938, the year he escaped from Vienna. His father had already been taken away leaving Leo, his sister and mother to face the growing persecution of all Jewish people. His mother, a very resilient Scottish lady, was desperately trying to get Leo to friends in England. For many weeks all attempts had failed until a lawyer friend suggested a possible way out, though the plan would involve risk and certainly embarrassment for her. The idea was that she should go in front of a Nazi tribunal and swear on oath that Leo was her illegitimate son by a German soldier. After a period of intricate and frustrating negotiations, she finally convinced her inquisitors and Leo was registered as such and thinking the way would now be clear, she arranged for Leo to go to England. A tearful departure from Vienna ensued and he settled down in a corner of a train compartment, a case with all his worldly goods on the rack above his head. He felt a distinct sense of relief from the tensions of the past months as the train sped on its way towards Innsbruck. The relief was to be short-lived. As the locomotive pulled into that border town, the compartment was empty apart from Leo and a young woman sitting reading in the opposite corner when the sliding door of the compartment was opened by a Nazi soldier who demanded that they show their passes. His officious manner scared Leo, but not apparently the woman who was a reporter from the New York Times on her way home from Austria where she had been reporting the Nazi German Anschluss. As she put her pass back in her handbag, the German turned on Leo as he nervously handed over his pass. He leered first at the pass, then at Leo. Off the train, he said. You're Jewish. We want to see you. Come on, off. Quickly. Leo protested as he got up from his seat and sat down again. The soldier made a threatening move towards him. Then all hell broke loose in the compartment. The reporter was on her feet as she screamed at the German. Leave him alone! Leave him alone! She was almost hysterical in her protests 
If you don't, she went on, I shall accuse you of a sexual attack. And pointing to a terrified Leo, she went on, and he will corroborate. The Nazi, taken completely by surprise, back towards the door as she continued to fume at him and he finally disappeared along the corridor cursing as he went and saying that he was going to get his superior officer. That lady, Leo said, saved my life. The train shunted over the border into Italy. Tears were near as he continued. Two days after that my sister was taken away. I never saw her again. He had reached England and found work as a repetiteur at Covent Garden where he worked under Beecham and also as an arranger and orchestrator of music for feature programmes at the BBC. He spent some months as an alien in the Isle of Man during the war years before joining the BBC in 1947 as assistant to the conductor of the BBC Theatre Orchestra, Stanford Robinson. I shall always remember that evening. He looked so pale and ill as he recounted his depressing experiences, and yet in spite of this, one sensed a latent sense of humour. A few minutes later, we were discussing the possibility of performing together with a violinist, the Brahms Horn Trio, and I suggested Stuart Jones, who led the second violins in the orchestra, as he had often expressed a wish to play that work. Leo thought for a moment, then said without a trace of a smile, You realise that Stuart has an ulcer too. That makes three of us. We'll play it and call ourselves the Duodenal Trio. Leo's repertoire of funny stories was extremely limited, but the anecdote about Sir Herbert Beerbohm Tree, the English actor and theatre manager of the late 19th century, noted for his lavish productions of Shakespeare, was one of his favourites. Sir Herbert was apparently sitting in a train compartment at Euston Station awaiting its departure to the north where his company was to play Hamlet. He was joined just before the train started by a young actor who sat in the opposite corner and did not realise for a few minutes that he was ensconced in the same apartment as the great man. Tree was reading a newspaper and silence reigned as the train sped north. The young actor, nervous of opening a conversation, thought desperately of something to say. Eventually, summoning up courage, he began, Sir, do you really think that Hamlet sleeps with Ophelia? Sir Herbert, lowering his paper, looked at the young man for a few seconds before delivering his answer. I don't know what happens on tour, old boy, but in London we all do. Leo Wormser was once described in the press as slight in build with pale complexion, long, grey and crinkly hair growing back from a broad forehead deep-set eyes, rather eccentric. That would be a fairly apt description of the man, except that rather nervous in disposition would be more exact. He was an extremely nervous and highly strung individual, particularly when performing as the excellent pianist he undoubtedly was or as conductor. It is true he did have one or two idiosyncrasies. One was changing his jacket or cardigan frequently during rehearsals. He always had a spare draped over the rostrum and would stop the rehearsal to change depending on the room temperature. This particular mannerism brings to mind a broadcast which we did from Southerminster and it really was the most bizarre rehearsal. It was a rather warm June day but as always in Minster's cathedrals and churches it remained pleasantly cool inside. Leo was in a jacket changing mood as we began the rehearsal and at first he was cold, then hot, as he began to conduct. Near the front of the nave sat a middle-aged man. I had noticed his arrival earlier. Tall, well-groomed and immaculately dressed in a morning suit. My first thought was that he had probably been sent from BBC North region. Within seconds he was up from his seat assisting Leo to change his jacket. Although obviously irritated by this unnecessary assistance, Leo was polite at first But as the rehearsal continued and the gentleman repeated the act, Wormser got angry and told him to sit down and that he did not need further help. The man sat down immediately and appeared to be quite unconcerned by the rebuff. Very odd, but more was to come. We had finished rehearsing the Respighi Botticelli pictures and were about to continue with the Bach Concerto for two violins, in which Ernest Element and Dorothy Hemming were the soloists. 
Not being involved, I made my way into the nave and sat down to listen, a few rows behind the stranger, now sitting subdued but seemingly perfectly rational. Dorothy began the second violin part with, as ever, a lovely sense of style, whilst Ernest stood passively awaiting his entry. Our unexpected visitor was on his feet immediately, gesticulating and pointing towards Ernest, indicating that the concerto had begun. I now had serious doubts about this character, as did many of my colleagues. These doubts were finally confirmed at the interval, when I was walking from the platform carrying my horn. He approached me and said confidently, Don't you clean that instrument with rhubarb leaves. If you do, it will ruin it. Before we began the second part of the rehearsal, two men in white coats arrived and took the poor fellow away. He had escaped from a local hospital where he had been under observation, and though at first it had seemed amusing, we all felt a sense of sadness at the outcome. In spite of the upsets of the rehearsal, the performance of the Bach in the evening's broadcast was a particularly outstanding one, and they both eventually performed the work in the London Promenade concerts. The BBC Midland Orchestra was indeed fortunate to have two such fine players in the string section. Ernest Element led the orchestra around this time, but relinquished that position later to concentrate on work with his own string quartet. My brother Herbert and Ernest were particularly close associates since their early teens. They played together in the Spa Orchestra Scarborough, joined the CBSO under Bolt and later Howard in the BBC Midland Orchestra. Both studied with Paul Beard and later with Carl Flesch. Even in marriage there was a relationship. They married sisters and became brothers-in-law. They were divided by the outbreak of war in 1939 but came together again for nine years in the Philharmonia Quartet with Henry Holst and Anthony Peeney. That was a very busy time for them both, for as well as making many recordings, the quartet travelled extensively abroad and their stamina at times was severely tested. In one particular week, I remember, Herbert played in the Philharmonia concerts as principal viola, spent a whole day in Westminster Abbey in the orchestra formed for the coronation service under Bolt, and played the Bartok Viola Concerto in a broadcast with the Philharmonia, conducted by Paul Kletsky on the following day. After several days recording, he appeared at the proms as soloist with Broza in the Mozart Sinfonia Concertante for violin and viola. The Philharmonia Orchestra, since its formation in 1945, had received great acclaim, playing under the world's leading conductors, including Furtwängler, Richard Strauss, Klemperer, Cantelli and Carrion, and it reached a pinnacle of success in 1952 when Toscanini came to the Festival Hall to conduct two concerts, which included the four symphonies of Brahms. This was the maestro's final visit to England, and though disappointed, along with many hundreds more, not to obtain tickets, the memory of two superb concerts over the radio still lives on. End of chapter 16 to end this podcast episode, I am going to play Movement 2 of Andrew Dan's Sonata for Violin and Piano, since this was specially composed for a concert dedicated to the memory of Ernest Element, given on the 3rd of May 1994 in the Adrian Bolt Hall, Birmingham, by the Kingsdown duo Roger Huckle Violin and John Bishop Piano. Here it is performed by Rupert Marshall Luck on the violin with Duncan Honeybourn on the piano as part of their CD of all of Andrew Down's works for violin, viola and piano recorded by EM Records. <laughs>